Well, I am extremely excited about our midweek Bible study this week. Um, in honor of this being the week where we celebrate Good Friday, and in order to remember the death of Jesus on the cross, I'm going to try to teach a lesson um, entitled The Most Important Lesson. So I want to teach a lesson that I feel like, sincerely from the bottom of my heart, is the most important lesson from the Bible that a person could ever learn. And um, all these examples don't, aren't perfect examples, but it's kind of like somebody learning to play baseball, You're trying to teach somebody how to hit a baseball. The first thing, the, the most important thing is probably going to be to teach them you've got to keep your eye on the ball. There are certainly a hundred other lessons you can teach them eventually, but you've got to start there. Or I was thinking about trying to teach my kids how to drive. Um, the very first thing they're going to have to learn how to do when they learn how to drive is they're going to have to learn how to crank the car, how to put the key in the ignition and start the vehicle. If they can't do that, then there's nothing else that's going to matter at all. And the good news is keeping your eye on the ball and cranking a car are simple tasks. Those are things that everybody can understand. And the Bible lesson that I'm going to teach today is also a very simple lesson that everybody and anybody can understand. Um, I, I really do believe this. I believe the Bible is written for common people to understand and believe. And I also believe it's written for common people to, uh, I like to say this, to know and to be able to show what that means is that you know it yourself and you can actually show it to somebody else. And I really believe that this lesson is extremely important and it's extremely simple. And the, I, what I want to do is read a story out of the Old Testament and then read basically three verses out of the New Testament. And I'm going to try to keep it as brief as possible. But the story comes out of Numbers chapter 21. And... The story is not as famous as the story of Daniel in the lion's den. It's not as famous as Jonah and the whale. It's not as famous as Noah and the ark. But I will say with absolute certainty, it's more important. It's a more important story. And uh, the story comes out of Numbers 21. It's just six verses. And I'll read it and I promise, I absolutely promise you will understand this story. Okay? Now i got to find it in my Bible. But Numbers 21... You don't have to understand the background, but the background is kind of helpful. The background is Moses is bringing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, taking them through the wilderness to the promised land. They're in the wilderness, and they're tired of being in the wilderness, and they're in a bad mood. And so we're going to read this story starting in Numbers 21, verses 4 and 5. It says, Then they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. And so just right there you can see that the, the Israelites are not happy campers. And the truth of the matter is they have not been happy campers for a long time. Um, just two chapters earlier, the Lord says, 10 times you have complained and grumbled and basically what we would call pitched a hissy fit. So they were commonly doing this, just stopping and sitting down and whining and complaining and speaking against God and speaking against Moses. And I was thinking it's, uh, it's very challenging for me and Jennifer to put our five kids in the car and take them to Wendy's, which is 10 minutes down the road, without fist fights breaking out. And I say fights, plural. We'll have multiple fights going on at the same time in the car. And it's hard to ref two different fights while I'm driving, but we have those challenges. But these people are just like that. They are on a trip, and they're in a bad mood, and they're grumbling and complaining. Verse 6, hang in here. I promise you, you'll, you'll learn from this. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. So the bottom line is this. God finally punished the people. He sent poisonous snakes who invaded their camp and the snakes began to bite people and the people began to die. And it's, it's worth just saying this real quick. Um, God does punish people. Um, this is an example. God is patient with people. God loves people. But eventually if people continue to sin, God does punish people. 
If you picked up a Bible and just started reading it in the book of Genesis, you would see that God punished Adam and Eve. The next chapter, chapter 4 of Genesis, God punished Cain when he killed Abel. Genesis 6, God flooded the world and killed everybody but eight people because the world is a sinful place. So it should not surprise us if you, if you are uh, really think about what the Bible teaches and you see it in all kind of examples, God does love people. God is patient with people. The Bible says God is patient with you. Not only any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So God does this in this story, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. God just has had enough of this, and he sends snakes, they bite the people, and the people are dying. Verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. So this is kind of a turning point in the story. The people pop up and they realize and they say, we have sinned. We have not acted right. We had not treated you right. We had not said the right things about the Lord. We are sinful. Please pray for us that God will forgive us and that God will have mercy on us. So their, their response was um, actually pretty good once they realized and, and admitted what they were doing was wrong. Two more verses. Verse 8 it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So this, no doubt, is a strange story at this point. God tells Moses to make a fiery serpent or a bronze serpent and to put it up on a pole. And anybody who's been bitten by a snake, if they look at that snake that's on that pole, and I used to call this the snake on a stake, if they, if they will look at that snake, they will live. And that's uh, it's kind of interesting, just a little fact that you may or may not realize that uh, the medical symbol that you often see today is still a snake on a pole. Um, it's got a fancy name. I'm not going to try to pronounce what that symbol actually is called, but a lot of people think you can trace it back to this story of this snake in the book of Numbers, way back in the Old Testament, being lifted up on the pole. And God said, if anybody looks at that snake, they will live. The last verse is verse number nine. It says this, So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So um, Moses did exactly what God said. He, he took, made this form, this bronze serpent, lifted it up on a pole, and if anybody who had been bitten, people were dying, but if anybody who had been bitten by a poisonous snake looked, they just looked at that serpent on that pole, they would live. That solved the problem. And that's the end of the story. So I'm just going to review this story real quick. It's not the end of the lesson. It's the end of the story, though. What happened in our story? Anybody can understand this story. And I'm about to show you why this is so important. Uh, the people grumbled and complained. Uh, they were sinning against the Lord. God sends fiery snakes into the camp who bind the people. Some of the people die. Other people are obviously sick and dying. The people say, we have sinned. They pray, tell Moses to pray for them. God answers their prayer and says, look, I'll show mercy on you. If you'll take, make a snake, put it on a pole, lift it up, whoever looks at that snake will live. Now, that's actually a great children's story. That's a story that kids can understand. It's a story that adults can understand. Anybody and everybody can understand that story. We're halfway through this lesson, too. But why is that story so important? Why would I say this is the most important lesson in the Bible? Well, that story in and of itself does not seem that important. But I'm going to turn over to the New Testament and just read three verses out of John chapter 3. Okay? Now, in my opinion, if you had to take one chapter in the Bible and say what chapter in the Bible would be the most important chapter for me to read and understand, I would say John chapter 3 would be at the top of the list. There is no more important chapter in the Bible. And we're just going to read three verses out of John chapter 3, and you'll see why I read that story out of Numbers 21. I promise this will make sense. John 3 verse 14. This is what Jesus said. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Jesus talks about the story we just read. And he says, 
just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. I am going to be lifted up just like that. Obviously, he's talking about the way he would die on the cross. And here's the thing. If you can understand the story of the snakes in the Old Testament and that snake being lifted up on that pole, it really helps you understand the story of Jesus. It's a perfect example, a perfect illustration. And I'm going to go ahead and read these three verses together. John 3, 14, 15, and 16. This is what Jesus said. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So right there, Jesus is saying this. This is very important. Just like that serpent was lifted up, I'm going to be lifted up. That whoever believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. And then he states what we've now become accustomed to as being the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So here's the situation. In 2020, the world is not full of people who are dying from snake bites in the wilderness. That is not what is going on. But in 2020, the world is filled with sinners, with people who are breaking God's commandments, breaking God's law, who need to be forgiven and need to be saved. And if you can understand the story of the snakes from the Old Testament, it is, helps you understand our own situation. It helps you understand the solution for our situation. It helps you understand the hope that we have. And just to preach to you for just a couple of minutes, this is what we have to do. It's exactly what they had to do. We have to understand we have a problem. What is our problem? The problem is we are sinners in our story in numbers. They had to realize we have sinned against God. We've sinned against you. Well, the Bible, and I'm trying to keep this as simple as I possibly can, says this very plainly. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that every person, it's a universal problem. Every person has sinned. That means you've broken God's law. There's laws in Georgia. There's laws in the United States. There's laws in our house. There's, law, there's rules that we might have um, at school. But God has given laws. A lot of people don't even know what God's laws are. But they're in the book. They're on our heart. They're in our conscience. A lot of them are. But we sin and break those commandments. And the Bible says we all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned our own way. Okay? That means that we live for ourselves. We do what we want to do. We don't listen to the Lord. We don't follow the Lord. We don't serve the Lord. And so, just to, to make it as simple as I can, we have all said and done things that were 100% wrong. And we have to come to terms with that. We have to realize we have a problem. I read this verse last night, so I'm going to read it today. Um, this is kind of throwing in a little something extra, but um, I think it's worth our time. Uh, this is out of Proverbs 30. It says, There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet it's not washed from its filthiness. A huge mistake you can make is to think that you are pure in your own eyes. I'm not that bad. I'm not doing anything wrong. But the Bible says the reality is you've not been washed from your filthiness. The Bible says even our righteousness is a filthy rag. So we are all sinners. That's the problem. And this is what else you got to understand. And I'm trying to keep this simple. We cannot save ourselves. We are hopeless to save ourselves. And those people got bit by those snakes. They were dying. They were perishing. There obviously was no vaccine. There was no cure. There was nothing that could be done to save them. And the same thing is true. Jeremiah 2.22 says, You could wash yourself with soap and use an abundance of lye, but the stain of your guilt remains before me, says the Lord. The reality is this. When we sin, when we've done things wrong, when we broke God's law, we are guilty and we cannot change that. We cannot do good to make up for our bad. We cannot erase the sins that we've committed. We cannot override that. We cannot hit the rewind button. We sin, we're guilty, and we are not able to save ourselves. Those are just the, the lessons that are in, in our original story, and it's definitely taught throughout the Bible about our sin problem. Um, but this is, this is what we have to see, the solution. This is the good news of the whole Bible. This is the message of the whole Bible. This is the most important lesson of the Bible. We have to see Jesus, who died on the cross, as our hope. Okay, we look to him and we believe in him 
for eternal life, for our salvation. I'm a sinner who is perishing. I cannot save myself, but I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in him as my Savior. And so we, we put our hope, we put our faith, we put our trust in Jesus. Just like they look to that snake, we believe in him for eternal life. And, and that's the good news. This whole thing is good news. When they put that snake on that pole, that was good news to anybody who had a problem. That you don't have to deny you got a problem. You don't have to try to act like you're fine. You have a problem, but there is a solution. The same is true for us. I have sinned. I am guilty. I cannot change that. But Jesus died for my sins, and I believe in him for my salvation. Um, I, uh, I don't like that. I'm not, <laughs> I'll tell this joke. I'm not crazy about this joke, but I like the point this little joke makes. A man was driving his car down the road and he drove off the side of a cliff. And this is obviously not a true, <laughs> it's not a true story. This is what I call a preacher story. He drove off the side of a cliff and he jumped out of the window. I'm just making this up kind of. And he grabbed hold of a twig. And so this man's hanging off the side of this cliff, barely holding on to one twig. And he begins to holler, is there anybody up there? Can anybody hear me? Can anybody hear me? Help, help. And the Lord speaks. And the Lord says, I am the Lord. Let go of the twig. The man held on for a second and he said, is anybody else up there? It's just me and my wife in here, and I can make her laugh, and I can make myself laugh. <laughs> but that man wanted another way. And the, the, point that that, the point of that joke is, <laughs> the point of the joke is, sometimes people don't trust in Jesus till they realize there's nothing else for me to trust in. Okay, I can't, my righteousness is a filthy rag. I don't want to stand before God and try to say, well, I went to church and I preached a little bit and I, I tried to be a good husband and a good wife. I hope that makes up for all the sins I committed throughout the entirety of my life. And the reality is it's not going to do that. Okay? you got to realize I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. But then you, you look to Jesus and you believe in him. For your salvation, for eternal life. And I love this story because it's a story of grace. That's what the story of Numbers 21 is what the story of Jesus is. It's a story of grace. Um, there, there is, it has absolutely nothing to do with human effort. The people in our story who got bit by the snakes and they were dying, they did not do anything except look at that snake on that pole and miraculously they were able to live because of that. And so I, I love to say this just because I, I, it's such good news. I'm glad they didn't lift the Ten Commandments up and say, you've got to live by the Ten Commandments, then you can have, you'll live. If you can put your hand on these tablets and swear that you promise to live by these Ten Commandments the rest of your life, that's not what the story was about. It was just pure grace. There's no um, a promise to do better in the years to come. You've got to make real changes or it's not going to count. No, it's just grace. It's just you look at that snake and you gain life. And the same thing's true in the New Testament. What the Bible's saying, this is the good news. You believe in Jesus. John 3, 16. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Period. It's not believe in Christ and, and, and swear that you're going to change. and Believe in Christ and, and go to church. Believe in Christ and live by the Ten Commandments. It's whoever believes. It's grace. It's forgiveness. It's, it's something that we didn't earn. But Jesus is the hero of the story. Okay? And I'm, I'm almost done. But if you think about this, snakes in the Bible were cursed creatures. Genesis 3.14, uh, when, when the snake appeared with Adam and Eve, and the Lord told the snake, now you're cursed more than every creature. It was, it was, a snake was a cursed creature. Well, the, what the Bible says, and I'll quote two verses out of Galatians. Galatians 3.10 says, Cursed is the man who does not continue to do all things written in the book of the law. That means unless we do everything written in this book, we're under a curse. A curse the, fr from the Lord because of our guilt. But the Bible says in Galatians 3.13 that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become cursed for us. As it is written, cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. See, Jesus is just a crazy story of God's love, that God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins on the cross. 
and he became cursed. He took our sin upon himself, and he died for me. He died for you. He died so that we could live. And the simple instruction for us is to look and believe in him. Put your hope, your faith, your confidence, not in yourself, not in what you're going to do in the future, but you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner who cannot save yourself. You believe in him. And the um, Bible says, by grace we're saved through faith, and that not of ourself. It's a gift of God, not of work, so no man can boast. There's nothing that I have done. There's nothing that anybody has ever done to make themselves right with God. It is simply just like in the story. They looked at that serpent. We look and we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And grace is the fact that God accepts me and forgives me and gives me eternal life because of Jesus' death on the cross and because he rose from the grave three days later. I am forgiven because of what he did. And the, the very simple thing is this. You have to have the personal experience of doing what the story is talking about. You have to experience this. What do I mean by that? Well, you have to have the experience of looking to Christ and believing in Christ for, for your salvation. See, if the survivors out of Numbers 21, they could have told you their stories very easily. They could have been interviewed by CNN on the spot. Well, I got bit by a snake, and I got real sick, and I was dying, and my cousin told me that if I would go to the middle of the town square and look at this snake on the pole, I would live. And I went, and I understood that, and I looked at that snake on the pole, and I, and I, and I was healed. Well, you got to be able to tell your story. I realized I was a sinner. I realized I had a problem. I realized that I wasn't good enough on my own. I couldn't save myself. And I heard the good news about Jesus, and I believed in him for eternal life. And I love what the song Amazing Grace says, how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. And there's a time when you believe. You understand this is grace. This is a gift. This is not me. This is what Christ did for me, and you believe in Christ. And I just close by saying two things. We don't want to make this harder than it is. Okay, John 3, 16 is summarizing the story. That is the message of the Bible. That is the good news of Christmas, the good news of Easter, the good news of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, the whole book. That is the good news, that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us, that we believe in him. We would not perish, have everlasting life. And I will stress this. There are many more lessons everybody needs to learn. There are so many lessons in the Bible. It is filled with just valuable lessons and sermons that can be taught and, and things that wisdom that can be gained. And even in John chapter 3, Jesus is, uh, there, there's so many lessons, I'll just say that. But we cannot lose sight of the simplicity of how we actually gain eternal life. It's through faith in Christ. And so if I'm teaching somebody how to hit a baseball, I'm teaching them all kinds of things. Yeah, first thing, keep your eye on the ball. Then you got to uh, load, you got to cough, you got to use your hips, you got to uh, finish high, you got to um, uh, push off your back leg. All kinds of things we can talk about. And if we're teaching somebody how to drive a car, there's obviously all kinds of things. You got to crank the car, you got to check your mirrors, you got to um, you got to put it in gear, you got to match the gas brake, turn signals, all these things. We can get into all that at some point, yeah. But and that's the way Christianity is. There's a lot of growth that needs to take place, a lot of maturity, a lot of lessons, a lot of discipleship. But we cannot ever lose sight of the simplicity of how a person gains eternal life. It's by knowing I'm a sinner and claiming and believing in Christ as my Savior. That is what the Bible is prescribing. That's the good news. And the last thing I'll say is this. You cannot. This is the second danger. Just assuming you must have got this right. See, I think uh, the Bible is very clear about this. And Matthew 7, 14 says that very few people ever find the narrow gate that leads to life. What that means is a lot of people... Um, very few people ever actually understand what I'm saying. You might, you might assume, well, everybody knows this about Jesus. Well, I, I think that uh, people often have a very vague, foggy idea about how a person becomes a Christian, what it means to be a Christian, how a person is forgiven. They know it has something to do with Jesus, uh, something to do with uh, uh, living right, living better, going to church, getting baptized, changing your ways, just kind of put all this together, and I think we got some kind of Christianity. Well, that's just not true. That is not. It is not a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of me, a little bit of church, a little bit of baptism. It is, it, it is not true. This is what you've got to understand. It is grace alone, and it is faith alone, and Christ alone. 
It is me trusting in Christ. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how a person is saved. You give up. Is anybody else up there? Forget about anything else. It is nothing else. It is me trusting in Christ and what he did on the cross. And if somebody asks me, why do you think you have eternal life? Why do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? There's only one answer that's come out of my mouth. It's because of Jesus, because of his death, and because of the fact that he came alive three days after he died, which proved he was God's son. It is because of Jesus. That is my hope. Uh, that is the only hope that I have. I hope that you can say the same thing. And there's a time and a place when I realized this. I understood I'm, I've got a, a problem that I can't solve, but I see that there is hope, and it's Jesus. And so um, I hope you see yourself as a sinner. I hope you see and believe in Jesus as your Savior. And I think that is by far, by far, the most important lesson. And I really hope that eventually you get to the place where not only do you understand that, but you know that and you can show that to somebody else. It is not that complicated. It is not intended to be that complicated. Obviously, there's much more. There are thousands of other lessons, but that is the most important lesson. That is where we start, and so I hope that helps you. I hope you're looking forward to Easter this weekend. Um, I know most churches will not be meeting together, but I hope you still experience and can celebrate the fact that, we, um, that Jesus died for us. He rose again. That gives us hope, and it gives us eternal life. And I pray that you understand that, and I hope that you celebrate that wherever you are this weekend. Uh, God bless you. Hope you have a good rest of the week.